Today, Father, our knee bows, our tongue confess that you are our God. Today, Father, we are so grateful for what you've done to each and every one of your children, not only C3 Bowood, but C3 all over the world, Father. Father God, we thank you for our family here, C3 Bowood, and our families are away overseas, Father God, and our families that are unwell this morning, Father. Father, as we stand in your presence, We submit them to you, God. Father, we trust you with everything, oh God. You are magnificent, you are awesome, and you are great, oh God. Can we give him another clap of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we praise and worship. And everybody say, amen. Amen. Take a seat or say hello to someone new next to you. Test, okay. test, test, okay. test, okay. test. Signal, testing, yeah, yeah. testing, yeah. testing. Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> New year, huh? 2023. How awesome is that? You know, I'm, some of our people are actually awake. Thank you very much, Mrs. Skelton. Um, 
Um, so um, I'm about to talk about our tithes and offerings. If you're visiting today, something that we, just to let you know, something that we do as a church to support um, our ministries. Um, there's two ways of giving. Uh, you can give through direct debit or the Tithely app. And we have a box at the back if you prefer to give cash. Anyway, I have a scripture which is 2 Corinthians 9-7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I know the, the reason why I, I love this scripture is because of our church. We are cheerful givers. I think two years ago, um, Joel started a doing hampers for people around the church, I mean, around our area. And I think we started off with just um, doing five hampers, I think something like that. And then last year, we thought of doing 10. And actually, it actually got up to about 16, 16 hampers. And it just shows how much of cheerful giving that our church does. And we have so, so many great stories of people that, you know, that receive these things, and, and they're so appreciative. So... I just love that our church is a cheerful giving church, you know, and I really want to thank each and every one of you for giving to the last year, you know, towards our, our tithes and, and our offerings and has helped our church, you know, grow to where it is today. And I know 2023 is, is going to be even better with, you know, more giving and, you know, just giving out of a heart of wanting to give because of what God has given to you. So we're just going to pray. Thank you, Lord. Father God, as we give today, we just are thankful that you have given us that heart of being cheerful, Father. And I pray that we continue to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, that was good. Love it. Um, Pastor Joel and I, we were the ones that go and deliver the hampers. Um, yes, and it was so good. One particular family was crying. Oh, and Annie. So Annie, yeah, um, the, the school was so happy, eh? the teacher, the principal and the teachers. But one, one occasion, uh, myself and um, Annie, we went to this family and we didn't know what to do because the lady that we gave it to was just boring her eyes out. And then in a very, like, um, the cry and we was just like, wow, it really, it really warmed our heart. And we thank God that that's his gratefulness um, to God for helping because this lady's husband is in jail. And her son that's in year 12 has to drop out of school just to go and work to pay the rent. So um, we nominate this family because of what's happening. And she doesn't know it's coming. So we gave them men because there's eight of them. So we gave them two hampers. We gave them all the toys. And the cry just tell it all. So we give God the glory for all your giving hearts. Okay, so we're going to go to communion, the best um, menu of the day, <laughs> after the major menu. But uh, we're going to invite you, um, beautiful Annie, to do our communion. We give him a warm up. Good morning, church. Um, wish you all a very happy new year. It's been a week already, like 2023. It's no more a new year now, right? Yeah. Um, and that was the first thing that, something that surprised me was when Pastor Joel messaged me, you're doing communion this week. I'm like, okay, yes. Yeah, I didn't know that before, like <laughs> midweek, right? And he found me. I'm not on WhatsApp. And like, he knows where to, you know, find me, I guess. Anyways, I'm happy. I said yes. Because God has been talking to me. And um, I'm like in the holidays, I was all in that joyful mood. And God was there every night. I said, good night. Thank you, Jesus. I had fun during my holidays, not really spending time with God, to be honest. But when I got this message, I felt like God saying, yes, I am still with you. And God reminded me to like spend time with him again. Um, all right. What I'm really um, reminded or in my, what I felt in my spirit for the church this morning to share during communion is how good is our God, His goodness, um, that we will start this year, um, you know, we'll set the tone for this year that 
we will always remind ourselves how good God is to each one of us, not just to me, not just to someone in the church, but for each one of us. And his love is unique for each one of us. Um, and we are loved. We're dearly loved. And we are saved by his grace. And I felt like, how would I say that God loves me? How would I tell anyone that God loves me and God loves you? And I was taken to the scripture, 1 John um, chapter 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might love through Him. Amen. Now, the way He loved us is by sending His only begotten Son into the world. He did not spare His Son for us. And that's how much He loved. And as we come around the table, Let's remind ourselves this love that you can see. It's not just some imagination. He went on the cross. We see the broken body and the shed blood for us. And what did that do? It gives us forgiveness of our sins. And not just that, a relationship that we have with God. We do good. Um, through the week, I've also been with my daughter. I've been to the Jewish Museum, right? Um, I felt God spoke to me over there as well. Like, you know, when you go in that kind of atmosphere, it's more of like what is good, what is bad, what is worse. You, felt so, you feel so challenged. We, that's not something that we experience every time. But then that was something that I felt very challenging when people, the survivors talking about what they've been through. And, you know, if people don't believe in um, God, some of them, Whatever I've heard um, there, it, it was something very challenging for me. For me, it's like, you know, there is God no matter what. That's how we grew up. That's what we read the word. That's our community. That, that's what we do. That's what we know. But there are people out there in the world that have been through stuff. And it's, it gets very hard for them to believe that this is true. And um, I lost my point, I guess. Anyways, um, yeah, that's where I felt like, yeah, doing good. There's good, there's bad in the world. And there are, more, there are people who only say that, you know, we can do good. We keep doing good, that's enough. People who don't believe in God, they say, you just do good to everyone. But can I say, as humans, we are good in one area and we fail terribly in the other. And that's where I, feel, I felt God tell me, I care about both. I know you will do. I know you can be worse. How good it is when God comes around and says, that's all right. I'm going to hold you. And that's the love of God for me this morning. And that's what I wanted us to remember all year this year. That no matter what happens, what we go through, when we come around this table today, let's set that tone for this year that no matter what happens, that I will hold on to God because he loves me no matter what. Right. And um, if you want to uh, take part in the communion in the element, you can come forward. If you want to sit back at your seat, um, the elements, someone, one of us will come around and pass it on.
let's stand to our feet and worship the Lord. Come on, my 
find you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know no, it's, it's not much, nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing.
to sing this beautiful verse with. It just reminds me like New Year's come and go. There's always seasons in our life. But what remains is the love of God. You know, this, this song really spoke to me this year. And I think we should carry this through this year. That one thing remains is the love of God. No matter what in our lives. I think we'll sing one more time. as we stand before your throne in worship. We thank you for your love. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your words say that your thoughts, our thoughts are not your thoughts. You are unlimited, God. This morning, as we sing that your love never fails, you never give up on us. We stand in the beginning of 2023. Open up our hearts and our mind and our soul in taking that in. Because your thoughts are not my th our thoughts. Help us not to limit you, God. Help us just to let go to you and accept your unconditional big love into our world in 2023. We want to give you glory. Can we give him a clap offering? He deserves all the glory. He deserves all the honors. He deserves all the praise. Thank you, Lord, that you are God. You are God. You're not human. You don't think like us. You are God. And we praise your mighty name in 2023. Thank you for loving us beyond borders, beyond our own mind can comprehend. We're standing and we say we glorify your wonderful, wonderful name. In the name of Jesus, we worship and everybody say amen. Can we give him another clap offering? Amen, amen, amen. Wow, we welcome our beautiful pastor, Pastor Joel, to utter the Word of God this morning. Can we give him a clap offering? 2023. Morning, everybody. So good to see you. Good to have holidayers back. You look tanned. <laughs> Pretty nice out the top there in Singapore, was it? And it's great to have my uh, great friends, the Kennys, here with us, my, my, Mike and Mel and Gemma. Very good. If you're just uh, wanting to know who these people are, just keep an eye on the younger one of the three because if you ever go out to the opera in the time in the next few years, you might see this face, you know. So uh, very, very, yeah, it's good to see you guys. Thank you for coming. They're all, they're actually all three of them are famous musicians, so, you know. I, do you like how I use the word famous there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just like I'm a famous pastor, right, in the same sort of way? <laughs> 
Oh, it's so good. So we're in our, uh, we're, we're, it's summer. Happy New Year, everyone. It's great to see you. Great to have you with us uh, today. Our first service for the year, uh, kicking off our year. And uh, uh, we are going on holidays um, tomorrow. Our family uh, take off. So we had yeah, Joe's over there cheering. Um, we are he- heading up to the coast, uh, spend some time with family, but also just on the beach, you know. Hopefully we'll come back with a tan too, you know. And, and it's... <laughs> Oh, it's good. It's good. So, um, yeah, so we'll be away for two weeks. So if you uh, want to get in touch with us and you ring my phone and if I don't answer, it's not because I don't like you. It's just simply because it's switched off and we don't really want to have long conversations with people while we're sitting there on the beach. We want to catch waves. We want to have a good time. So that's where we're going to be for the next two weeks. So, uh, but church goes on without us, you know, and that's great to know that we have a fantastic church that works just fine without us around. So uh, next week we have Pastor Carl knocking over Psalm 117. Uh, I, he's uh, been studying it and reading it. It's taken him a long time to get through this uh, four lines of Psalm. <laughs> So, no, that's next week. So um, I'm looking forward to catching up on all the recordings. So please, if you're on this computer desk while I'm away, make sure you hit record. Um, also, the week after that, Sherwin is going to bounce out of Psalm 23. Great one. Since uh, You know what I re- realized, uh, Sherwin, is that um, we started doing Psalm series uh, way back when we first launched into this church back in 2021 was our first summer here. And every year, somebody has preached on Psalm 23. So it's a great way to start the year. So I'm looking forward to your ideas and your word on that one. So it's going to be great. Actually, one year we didn't because we cancelled summer, didn't we? But you know what? Pastor Phil Sammons was going to preach on Psalm 23. So anyway, this is a great psalm and great way to start the year. Great way to start the year in general is looking at psalms. Psalms are fantastic because if you if you go through there's lots of different themes in psalms but generally speaking as you're going through there you're going to be reminded of how beautiful and wonderful God is and his relationship with us can be so close and personal like songs are songs are personal they're not Nobody, I mean, some people write songs that are pretty bad. Like I, Joe and I were listening to this band the other day. We, we went, Joe, Joe and I went and saw Guns N' Roses. Like, in a, a, yeah, it was pretty awesome, you know. Like, we were about a million miles from them. But it doesn't matter. It was really awesome to see Slash, you know, just nailing out some, all that sort of stuff. But one of the support bands was this band called uh, The Chats. And they're terrible. <laughs> like, you go, go, I, I encourage you. In, in, if you can listen to music in your car on the way home or when you get home, just put on one song and just relish in the t- terribleness. <laughs> Enjoy it. It's thoroughly enjoyable. Songs about going and getting a schnitty at the pub. Isn't that one of them? That's one of them. What's another one, Joe? Smoko. I'm on Smoko. So leave me alone. See, I've even got it stuck in here. I can't get it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. I even sound like him, don't I? But anyway, so it's uh, great. So most people write songs because they're actually a part of who their soul is, except for the chats. They, most people sort of want to get a part of their soul, connect with a relationship with something or someone, something that means more. It's deeper. It, it sort of it brings to life um, a, a relationship between a person or and a and maybe sometimes a thing, but same, often another person or even God. And so when we look at Psalms, they are intimate. They are relationship sort of expressions of people uh, throughout those period of time that were writing the Psalms. Jesus was all about Psalms. Uh, communion, they, sang, they would sing a Psalm at the end of that as part of the Passover meal. Jesus had often had Psalms as part of his practice of worship. If you look through there, it's kind of the subtle hints are there, but they're there. Jesus was all about Psalms. And so we're starting our year from Psalms. Um, I'm looking forward to it. So today, Psalm 144. But before we get to Psalm 144, in three weeks time, so we've got Pastor Carl, then we've got Sherwin, and then the week after that, we're looking at Psalm 16 from, I think, four or five different people. We're going to have a team of four or five. I'm not, I can't remember what number. I can't remember. I, I know who I asked, but I can't remember who said they would. <laughs> but it's quite a few, quite a few people uh, will stand here and give a short five-minute devotion on Psalm 16. So that's on the 29th of January. 
And I'm really looking forward to that because I'll be back for that one. And, and there's going to be some interesting and wonderful words spoken. I think Annie's doing it. I think Peter was said yes, I'm reminding you. And I, I, definitely Vivian, who just popped out for a second, I think. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to the different reflections on Psalm 16. And it's also great to have Fran back. Fran's been to Africa. Fran, yeah, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have you back with us. <laughs> Had a long holiday back. Did you have a good time? Yeah, good visiting family and friends and, you know, it's good. It's good to have you back alive and well. <laughs> so Psalm 144, is, as some of you will know it from, if you were around in the C3 church uh, in the 19, maybe late 80s, early 90s, you would have sung this psalm. You wouldn't have read this psalm. You would have sung it. It goes like this, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. And those people that were in church back there, they've got the melody in their head as they read it. Blessed be the Lord. It's like, it's really kind of a rocky song. Who trained my hands for war. I think it was a Pastor, Pastor Phil Pringle, wasn't it? And my fingers for battle, you know. Did you ever play that one, Pete? Yep. <laughs> it's a classic, isn't it? Blessed be the Lord, my rock. Or if you like that, blessed be is this idea of worship and praise be. It's more than just the word blessed. I think it says, yeah, it says praise be up there. So that's great. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. What a great image. Now, David, who wrote the psalm, was a soldier. He was a military man and eventually became king. And David was always fighting. Like if you read through your Old Testament, through Samuel and through Kings, I think, or one of them anyway. If you read through that, you're going to find all about David and David's battles that he was constantly winning. Right from the very first one with Goliath, David and Goliath, all the way through to really the end of his life. David was a regularly and constantly at war. And so he, but he was fighting God's battle. At the same time, he was a poet and wrote songs. And so this one is a psalm of David. And he's reflecting on what's going on for him in life. And, and, and he's singing back to God, praise be to you, God. Why? Well, there's three reasons that I want to go through today. But before we do, I want to ask you a question. If I was to ask you to write five or six, maybe four words down right now that describe God, I'd love for you to think about what those four or five words are. In fact, if you're a notepad person or a pen and notepad old school person, why don't you write down four or five words that describe God? If you're not, if you're a tab, like a phone, smartphone person, pull out your notes thing and write four or five words that you think of when I say God. What do you think of? What are the, I mean, how would you describe God? Obviously, God is vast. If you read your Old Testament, you're going to find hundreds of words to describe God. But I want you to think, what are the top four or five that come to your mind? I mean, what are the greatest poets I know is in this room with us today? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And, and, and Mike is great at words. He's great at, at, at putting words together in that draw pictures. But for now, don't worry about being too poetic. Just come up with four or five words that you would use to describe God. It's a, it's a, I mean, you could, you could, where could you start? You could start in all kinds of places, right? A lot of people will start with, you know, uh, my experiences of God. So my, my God, I remember when God saved me when I was first became a Christian. So I might say, a saviour. Uh, or I might go, oh, another experience I had that time where, you know, I was about to cross the road in front of, uh, in front of oncoming traffic and I was without even thinking about what I was doing. It, I felt like a wall. You know, this is a true story, but I felt like I ran into a wall. The car zoomed past and then I kept going. It was this stranger situation. So maybe God is my protector. Right? I, might, I might write that word. So if you want to use your personal experience, you might start using words like that. Some of you might be well-versed in the Bible. So you might be going, oh, well, I'm going to use some Bible words. I'm going to go Hebrew. I'm going El Shaddai. I'm going Elohim. I'm going Yahweh. What other words um, can I think? Uh, Jehovah Jireh, you know. <laughs> I don't know what any of those words mean today, but we can, we can go into that another day. But for some of you, you might have been writing words like that because that's how you've been schooled and thought. Some of you will go to the New Testament. 
And you go, Jesus. Well, Jesus is a Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So whatever words you might want to use to describe Jesus also describe the Father. So you might go, Lord. You might go, um, yeah, yeah, definitely healer. You would go, uh, redeemer. These sort of New Testament ideas, New Testament words. I wonder what words you've written. So I wonder where you've gotten your words from. Well, let's get back to our Psalm 144. Keep your words handy. Uh, Psalm 144, uh, David's writing some words. But every one of the words David writes in this first verse, but if you keep reading, you're going to find that every single one of them has one little word in front of it. And that word is my. When he, get, he didn't just say God is our rock. He said the Lord is my rock. He didn't say that he just trains generally hands for war. He trains my hands for war. He doesn't just say, if we go to the next verse, um, I think it says, my, what does it say? Yeah, my loving. It doesn't say just he is a loving God. He says he is my loving God. He doesn't say he's a fortress. He's my fortress, my stronghold, my shield, my deliverer, my refuge, my subduer, if you want to kind of just jiggle around some of those words there. It's all about, he's personalized it. So if you look at your list of four or five words that you've written down, could you add the word my in front of that? So if you wrote redeemer, write my redeemer. If you wrote creator, write my creator. If you wrote, if you wrote um, well, whatever, what doesn't matter what you wrote. Uh, Lord, write my Lord. Savior, write my Savior. Go through all the list of words that you might have written and thought about. And add the word my. Make it personal. That's what this psalm does. It's personal. It's personal. Sometimes I think we can get we can get too general with God and say, oh yeah, he's the Lord. And, it's, and it sounds like we're honoring him by saying, yes, he is the Lord. And we are honoring him by going, yes, he is the Lord. But it's easy for us to kind of ignore the fact that he is the Lord when he's not my Lord. So it's worth it to say he's my Lord. Of course, it's worth it to also say he's your Lord and their Lord and everybody's Lord. But today, I just want us to think on this idea that he's my Lord. Now, if we look at this verse, we go back to that first verse. Thanks, Annalise, who's just popped in there with no training whatsoever. So see how you go. Um, the, fir- the first that I said, first one of Psalm 144. Anyway, blessed be the Lord, my rock. David says, my rock. He personalized it and says, my rock. And I got thinking about this. Um, we went and saw Avatar 2, uh, which was a visual spectacle. I, I was, I, my comment, somebody said, did you like it? Was it a good movie? And I don't want to, you know, if you walked away and said it was the best movie you've ever seen, well, I, I don't want to create an argument. But at the end of the day, I went, oh, it's a visual spectacle. It's like when you go to the aquarium, you don't expect to see a story. You expect to see beautiful fish, Right. When I went to saw Avatar 2, I didn't see a beautiful, a great story. In fact, as we were driving away, I'm like, if they'd have just done this and this, the story would have made, it would have been so much better. <laughs> anyway, but it was definitely a visual spectacle. Very enjoyable to be kind of engrossed in the whole picture. 3D, you know, Avatar. Anyway, on our way to the cinema, we dropped off at Woolworths to get some uh, movie snacks because we're cheap. We don't want to. We, we don't want to pay cinema prices. <laughs> Way too expensive, right? You don't get a coat. What did Joe got a one, almost two liter bottle of one point two five liter bottle of some sweet thing, which it, which it, you know is like for seventy nine cents or something, a dollar twenty. You know, two bucks. Go to. Go to, uh, go, to, uh, the, go to the cinema, you get like a little cup for $12.95, right? You know, and there's ice all through it, you know. So anyway, so we're cheap. But we go to Woolworths and I don't, I, I already brought some stuff from home. That's how cheap I am. I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even go to the shops. <laughs> so, so Vanessa and I had stuff in, in, in Vanessa's bag ready to sort of stash it through and be all sneaky. Um, <laughs> but the kids wanted to get a couple of things. They, got, they had a little bit of money because of doing some stuff for a neighbor. And they're like, okay. All right. Well, we'll wait outside. So Vanessa says, let's wait here. Now, the place that Vanessa said to wait was right in the middle of the walkway. That's, you know, it's a big walkway. So it's not a big deal, right? <laughs> like, it's not as if people can't get around us. And then I'm, but straight away, I am feeling anxious. 
I hate standing in walkways. It's like this thing, this feeling comes over me of, I am constantly in the way. I, you know, I am getting whiplash by how many times I'm just making sure that I'm not in somebody's way. I'm getting dizzy. I'm starting to fall over. Do you know I hate the Sydney, Royal Easter Sydney show? Not because I don't love animals. Love animals. Not because I don't love produce. Love produce. Not because I don't want to be around all the things that they're showing. Love show bags. Love all the rides. I don't even mind the noise. But what I hate about it is that I always feel like I'm in the way. Did you notice that? Have you, 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 maybe I'm the only one, but, I, you know, standing there in wherever you are, it doesn't matter where you are at the Easter show, always somebody wants to go through you to see something else. That's what I feel like. So I am constant. It was a terrible day. I get to the end of it in complete completely exhausted. So, so Vanessa chose this place in the wolf and I'm like, I can't stand there. So, so I'm like, I'm going over there. Vanessa's like, don't go over there because we told the kids we'd be here. It's like, it's just there. But I'm, I'm going somewhere where I can lean my back against something so that I don't feel like I'm in the way. You know what I'm saying? You know? I think it was a rail or a fence. It doesn't matter. I got out of the walkway. I hated the idea. And there's this sense that when you don't have something at your back, there's a sense of anxiety. And for David, it was real fear. Because if he didn't have something solid at his back, real enemies. I mean, I just feel slightly anxious because I feel like I'm in the way. If he had real enemies behind him, that's a real threat. So he would have felt a real kind of anxiety. I want to say we also feel real kinds of anxiety. Like, I don't know. We, we all do. And I'm not going to go through all the different kinds of real anxiety that you and I feel. But I think that it's true to say, I mean, obviously me feeling like I'm in the way is pretty lighthearted. But in truth, I think we all have true real anxieties. Maybe around money and having enough to survive. You know, maybe about new babies on the way. <laughs> That's a real anxiety, isn't it? <laughs> but maybe it's about job security. Maybe it's about what do I do when I retire? I don't know. You may have real anxieties. But what does this scripture say? The scripture says, blessed be the Lord, my rock. God is wants us to be leaning on him. He's calling us. He's inviting us to be to have him as your rock at your back. Like the word for rock in the Hebrew translates to rock. <laughs> like it's not something weak. <laughs> Thought you'd like that, you know. But it's true. And it actually means big rock. It can mean even cliff face. But it's like something solid behind you. Like God. When we lean toward God, we have something solid behind us. We don't need to fear. We, that anxiety that starts to capture us, we've got to remind, no, blessed be the Lord, my rock. But one thing I will say before we move on to the next part is when you move away from the rock, the rock stays there. And when I've moved away from the rock, the rock doesn't stop being the rock. I've just moved away from it. Like it doesn't matter what movie you watch, the rock is always the rock. Sorry, that was terrible, but <laughs> we watched a terrible movie <laughs> last night <laughs> with the rock in it. It's like, anyway, <laughs> trying to make a serious point, and I go and make undermine myself. All right, so um, the rock, but it's true. The rock stays the rock, and I think sometimes we walk away from the rock. We walk away from God. We start going in our own direction, trying to achieve our own goals and trying to achieve our own sort of hopes and dreams and these sorts of things, and instead... We've walked away from the rock. We've walked away from what's solid behind us. You know, I've been thinking a lot about Abraham. This year we'll, we'll be preaching through it. I'm going to have got a, got a six, eight-week preaching series on Abraham as we walk through the year, later in the year. But one of the things that he did was that he, he, God had said, you will be prosperous. God had promised him that. And so here he is going, oh, well, God has promised me. I'm maybe sub, 
This may not be in the scripture, but I'm kind of working it out, right? So he, Abraham, at one point, he goes, well, God said I'd be pro- prosperous, so how's he going to do it? Right now, I look to my left and right, and all I see are fields. So how are we going to do this? And fields that I don't even own, how, we, how I know, we'll go to Egypt. And when we go to Egypt, Sarah, hey, here's an idea. Why don't you pose as my wife? I mean, sorry, as my sister. You pose as my sister. We'll go down to Egypt. When we get to Egypt, you, you tell everybody you're my sister. I'll tell them you're my sister. And then they'll start giving me gifts in the hope that, you know, I will, I will, I will say that they can marry you. And I'll just keep receiving gifts, receiving gifts. And then when we've got enough to be prospered, then we'll take off overnight and we'll have all this when we go back to the promised land that God is. If you look at the text, that's pretty much what's going on, right? He walked away from the land God had asked him to be in and suddenly he walked into a place where God wasn't his rock anymore. Did you know it was a good plan? It was a great plan of Abram's? Do you know why it was a good plan of Abram's? Because the person who has all the power and authority in, in this sort of brother, sister, find a wife, uh, find a husband moment is the brother. Abraham all, had all the power. He could just say no, yes to whoever he wanted. It didn't matter. People would give him gifts and, and in the hope that he would say yes. So da- Abraham had all the power and it was going to work. It was definitely going to work. There's only one person in the whole of Egypt who could stop that happening. And that's the Pharaoh. But it's, the Pharaoh is not going to go for you, Sarah. It's okay. She's beautiful and all. Well, the one person who did was the Pharaoh. The one person who had more power in that relationship was the Pharaoh. And so Abram's plan failed. He walked away from the rock. And suddenly he was left anxious. Suddenly he was left with like, I don't know what's going to happen here. And God looked after him. And we know that from the story. And God would look after you too. But the truth is, if we walk away from God, we walk away from that solid foundation. You know, and we do it day to day when we make a decision that takes us away from the Lord, that takes us away from his guidance and his, from where he's asked us to be. And so let me encourage you, if you feel like you've walked away from God at some point, take a few steps back. Lean back on God. And then you can say again, blessed be the Lord, my rock. Now, the one thing that David was obviously thinking going is, well, a rock is a good, solid, strong, foundational thing. But the problem with a rock is a rock doesn't move. But I need something that moves. And God, I know that you, you, you do move. And so he's going and going, yeah, well, there's more to God than just a rock. He goes to the next thing. He goes, no, the Lord is, uh, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for, my, for battle. God is not just my rock. He's my trainer. He's actively involved. He's not just this static, solid thing that we need to stay close to. He's also interested and actively involved in our lives, trying to help us become who we're going to be. David knew this firsthand because if you think about David, right, way back in David, the very beginning, uh, David walks up to this battle where Goliath is over there taunting Israel, right? Now, you all know David and Goliath, right? I, I feel like everyone knows that. Even if you've never been to church, you've heard of David and Goliath. So there he is. So, so you've got Goliath taunting all of Israel and all of Israel trembling in their boots, not knowing what to do, Saul the king, not knowing what to do, who would take him on. And, and David's just walked up to this as a farm boy from a little town called Bethlehem, right? That's all he was. He was a teenage farm boy. He'd never held a sword in his life as far as we could tell. He would walk around looking after sheep and, and just carrying them around. He was the youngest son even. He was no one of significance. But what he knew was that God had been actively involved in his life right from a very young age. We can see that because as soon as he saw uh, 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 Goliath saying, oh, you know, you Israelites, you're all weak. As soon as he saw that, David had this sort of, no, our God is stronger. Our God is mightier. And he recalled something. In that moment, he walks to, up to Saul, the king, and he recalled something. He said, when I was out in the fields... I fought bears and lions off. If a lamb got taken, I would track down that lamb and, or a bear and I would slay that lamb and bear. And this 
Philistine, to use the language he uses, but this man, Goliath, he'll be like a bear. He'll be like a lion. I, I've slayed them. I could slay him too. And it's like, I reckon this is what he was thinking of when he said, blessed be the Lord of my rock who trains my hands for war. Even when I was a farmer, God was training my hands for war. He was preparing me for what he was calling me to be. Now, at the time, I think he probably didn't think that. He'm like, God, why have, you stopped, why have you allowed my land to be taken by a bear? I bet at the time he was like, why am I having to kill? Why? This is scary. At the time, I bet you when he saw a lion there with one of his lambs, I'm, he went for it, but I bet you it was a pretty frightening moment. I bet you at the time he never even thought that one day, I mean, of course he didn't think he'd be one day he'd be king. Like, who would even think that? I would not think of that of myself, and let alone David being a remote farm boy. Like a, you know, I don't know. You know what I mean? So he's out there, but he's reflected back and gone, yes. Even those hard things that I went through as a little farm boy, as a teenage farm boy, some of those things have trained me for what you called me to be today. And so you and I, I think sometimes we, we go through challenging things tough things, painful things, frightening things, hard things. And sometimes we're in the middle of them and we're going, God, why have you brought this upon me? Or we go, God, please save me and rescue me. But some of those things God is putting in your life to train your hands for something that's coming. And so if we have a challenge, okay, yeah, look, if you are feeling like it's if you're at the end of your rope, pray, God, rescue me. That's all through the scriptures too. Nothing wrong with praying, God, rescue me. But also add in there, God, what are you doing in me through this? If you can ask that question in the worst of moments, then you are on the way. You are seriously on the way with Jesus. If you can, if you can break apart from the pain and the fear and and anxiety, and say, God, what are you doing in me now to prepare me for some other thing in the future? You can con begin to then contribute with God. Suddenly, God, your trainer, the one who trains you, suddenly becomes, well, you begin to realize how wonderful it is that he is so actively involved in your life. You start to go, wow, I like this challenge, this hard thing that I'm going through. God, you're building something in me. I can see it. I'm far more resilient than I ever was. I'm far stronger than I ever was. You know, the only way you're going to build muscle is through resistance. Like nobody gets big biceps by picking nothing up. It's just true. You've got to go to the gym or you've got to pick up some stuff. You need resistance in order to grow. And so he's I reckon you and I and David was all the same going, God, blessed be, you are my rock. I don't need to fear. Like You're my rock. I don't need to fear. But all these things that I'm going through, I need to start trusting you that you are actively involved in trying to turn me into something. You're trying to build me into something. I always feel a bit of camaraderie with David because David was a farm boy from Bethlehem and I'm the son of goat farmers from Mandurang. <laughs> it's really it's true <laughs> i'm totally by the time i was i was 11 years old i was the son of people who were farming goats in a town called mandurang outside of bendigo victoria but even some of those experiences i i still recall some of the things that happened in there and go you know what some of those things have shaped me you know, when you're a farmer, you learn to deal with seasonal change. You learn that one week doesn't mean everything. Because you're learning that, you know, this, this growth takes a season. Like plants take a season, but animals take many seasons to grow. And to, a scratched knee doesn't mean the end of the world because you know that it's going to get better down the track. You learn these sort of things in this farming world. And, I, and so now if you fast forward to who I am today, some of those things, don't, I don't get worried when things don't go great first time. I don't, and I know that there's going to be seasonal shifts. Sometimes there'll be good moments, sometimes there won't. But I've learned that because God trained my hands way back when I was a farm boy from Mandurah. 
encourage you to go visit Nanjarang. You all forget that word. <laughs> Joel said some word. <laughs> okay, we're going to finish off one more. Now, I wonder if any of you wrote the word my rock as your list of words. I wonder if any of you wrote my trainer as your list of words. The third one that I want to pick up is the very next one from the very next word, verse. And it says that uh, he is my loving God. Now, that's an interesting translation. Many of your Bibles, if you read them, will say, he is my loving kindness. That's probably the most common way that that word is translated. It's a Hebrew word, one of the greatest Hebrew words to learn. If you're going to learn a handful of Hebrew words in your life, learn this one first. It's hesed, or K-H-E-S-E-D, if you were to write it in English. You know, it's like it's It starts with a ch. How do you spell that? Ch. E. Hesed. Hesed. Kesed. It's a great Hebrew word which doesn't have a translation in many other languages. In fact, I don't think in any other language. And so loving kindness as one word was, was a word invented to try to interpret this word chesed. But it's a great word that you, need to, you and I need to sort of embrace, learn, make it part of who we are. And I'll tell you why because we'll dig into what that word means before we finish today. So, so this word chesed, loving kindness. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful word. But before we get to just to pull that apart, if I look at this entire psalm, it doesn't seem to fit. Because he goes, my rock, my trainer, my fortress, my deliverer, my shield. They're all war words. So what the heck is loving kindness? It just doesn't fit, does it? But it's true. And David knew it was true. And he wanted to put it right at the start of his psalm because he wanted to capture a thought. Because he's like, David's. it's true to say that David was called by God to lead his people, but not just be a king who sits on a throne in peacetime. He was called to lead his people in wartime. David very rarely knew peace in his entire life. Very rarely. His Philistines were invading. He was fighting back. He had internal things. You know, Saul was chasing after him for a while, while, the king. So he very, very rarely knew peace. But in a sense, God called him to that. God called him to this, to lead a, str- a people and make them strong. So that was his call. And so it's no surprise that if you see this psalm, you see all these military metaphors, all these warlike words. But one thing he knew, one thing he knew was this chesed. He is my chesed. He is my loving kindness. So what does that mean? So actually the best way that people have tried to interpret that is to look at where it's found in the Bible and going, okay, well, we're trying to work out what it means on the basis of where it exists. And you know how you can kind of work out what the meaning of a word is if you're reading through a book and you're like, I've never seen that word before, but you keep reading on, you can start getting a sense of what the word means. That's how Bible ter- translators try to figure out what this word chesed means. If you were to go back in your Bible, about two or three pages, you'll find Psalm 136. And inside of Psalm 136, you're going to find the word chesed in there 26 times. And it's that big of a deal of a word. You know, so, so and it's translated, if you look at Psalm uh, uh, 136, you're going to just see every second line is the Lord, the Lord chesed or something like that. Anyway, they have that, but that word's in there. My God is my loving kindness. My God, you know, forever, my loving kindness, this sort of stuff, right? So, so what does it mean? So after all of that kind of figuring it out, there are kind of three main ideas that this word hesed captures. One of them is loyalty, enduring commitment, not, and which is not based on the other party's commitment back to me. So it endures even when the other party doesn't. Okay, so a modern agape love, that, or that love which is self-sacrificial love, that's kind of the idea there. This love that is like, even if the other person offends me, even if the other person rejects me, I will continue to be in relationship with them. I will. It's, from, it's not a dependent on their actions. It's who I am. So when we see this word loving kindness or hesed, that's one of the main ideas. Inside there is that... that my God is, my, if you like, is my enduring commitment. 
or my end, my loyal God. He's always going to be there, whether I fail or not, whether I do good or not. You know, it's actually, if you think about Moses um, through the exile and the guys were, you know, they, they got out of Egypt and, you know, they were walking through the desert and then they just keep complaining and moaning and God's like, I'm done with this people. Like, so he's talking to Moses. He goes, I am done with this people. Moses, let's start again. This is God's conversation with Moses. Now, I'm kind of making a little bit light of it, but it was pretty heavy at the time. We're done, done with this people, Moses. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. We'll start again with you and your kids. That's a pretty serious moment. God saying. But Moses didn't. Just say, oh, God, please don't, please don't, please don't, please don't, please don't. He said, please don't because of your hesed, because of your enduring commitment to this people. Please don't. And God relented. Moses, I mean, did God need reminding of who he was? I doubt it. But in that moment, Moses called on the nature of God, his enduring commitment. doesn't matter what you do. God is committed to you. That's one idea in Hesed. Another idea in Hesed is generosity. It's a sense where somebody who's strong and big and powerful freely gives with no expectation of return. So when David says, my loving kindness, when David says, my Hesed, he's like he's recognizing that what he has received in his life is a gift from a great and powerful God. So not only does he recognize that God is loyal and will be with me, but everything I have is a wonderful gift from God. And this idea of generosity is mixed, mixed in there. It's very important. Um, and the, the third has fallen out of my head. I'll come back. It's, you may just say it's love, actually. There's, a, there's another word that, they, that I was going to say, but essentially it is just, it's love. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heartfelt relational thing that we describe as love. And so when we see that in amongst this military thought, we're like, what do you, how can this word fit in that space? So, well, first of all, God, you're my rock. I don't need to be afraid. You are strong. You are powerful. And I am, when I am with you, I can't be really defeated. I might lose some battles here and there, but I can't really be defeated because you're with me. There's confident strength. And not only that, God, you're training me. You're molding me. You're shaping me. All of these bad and good experiences that I've gone through, they're shaping me and changing me and molding me. And, and this said is the reason. It's because of your enduring commitment. It's because of your generosity, God. It's because your love for your people. And so let me encourage you as we go into this year, Take a couple, if you feel like you've walked away from God a little, take a couple steps back, a little bit closer to God, and remind yourself that, God, you are my rock. You're the one I can depend on. You're not able to be moved by any enemy. You are strong. And as you walk through and reflect on some of the challenges you might have been through recently, or even some of the challenges you may face as the year goes ahead, God, you are training me. You are shaping me because you have a goal for my life. You want to achieve something with me and through me. And why do you want to do these things, God? Because you're just straight committed. You're commi- I don't know why you're committed to me, God, but you're committed. You're generous to me and you love me. And so I praise be is all I can say. Blessed be is all I can say. So let me encourage you, grab this. I mean, we didn't get anywhere near the end of the psalm, but I think the very beginning of it tells a big story. Take it with you into the year ahead. God, you are my rock. You are training me, and you are committed. You have an enduring commitment to me that I don't need to worry. I don't need to feel afraid when I fail. Your love for me remains. I mean, we sang that, didn't we? Your love never fails. Never runs out. When we stand to our feet as we we finish this service with a song, but let's pray.
God, let's pray this psalm over ourselves. Pray it over our wives and our husbands. Pray it over our kids. Pray it over our friends. Pray over our parents. God, you are my rock. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. We praise you, God, because you are my rock. I don't need to fear because you are my rock. I don't need to worry about what's coming up from behind because you are my rock. And though I might go through challenges, I can trust you, Jesus, that you are working something in me. You are developing me into something. You are you have something some future organized for me that this is important for me to go through to get to. So I pray, God, in those moments, help me see the way you are training me, the way you are training my hands and my fingers. And God, help me see and know your loving kindness, your hesed, your beautiful, enduring commitment to me, to us, your wonderful loyalty. Your your amazing generosity, God, that you would treat us as your brothers, uh, sorry, as your children. You, God, above all, would be so generous as to call us your children and to love us, even to the point of self-sacrifice in Jesus Christ. Help me carry those ideas into 2023, God. Help us to carry those ideas into 2023, Lord. Help this church, help all the church, really, carry these ideas into 2023. In your name.